I'm a genie. You're Aladdin. So Luca Nation, Cage just jumped on. We basically haven't had much of a chance to talk over the last, it's fair to say, three days. I mean, yeah. We did the NFL Whatnot show, which you guys love. Uh, but we haven't had a chance to really sit down and, like, talk, you know, what happened, what's happening in the hobby, how the Dallas Card Show was, how his life is, how Ian's feeling. So you guys I love asked, these Monday we, episodes. You are all business, PWC. Pause. You guys love these Monday episodes, our most listened to episodes, which is kind of like a brain dump of what happened over the weekend. So welcome back to Lucas Tigers and Bronzo. My, I apologize to pause you there. I just wanted to finish that. Are you Please. okay? I asked for this stuff. You wouldn't let me go because you wanted to save it for our Monday episode. PWCC, you were all business. You wanted to just talk about the PWCC stuff. I asked how was the Dallas show figure was all, you know, fresh on your mind. You know, you could talk about, you know, whatever else you got going down. But nope, you did not. You did not want to talk about that. We talked about it on whatnot. You were like, nope, nope. Going to have to gonna have to tune on Monday. So how's the Dallas show? The Dallas show was awesome. So a few things. The organizers did it. An amazing job. And, uh, you know, I come from the hospitality space. I, I really got to tip my hat, man. So the staff at the Marriott, the staff at the neighboring restaurants, but specifically I want to give a flower to the staff at the Marriott. I, It's okay to, when people are like, hey, it's, oh, it's no problem. Stay out as long as you want, all that stuff. They dealt with a car running into a generator. The power went out. It was not chaos and pandemonium, but – Obviously, for the staff, that's not easy. To a T, the security, the police, the people that were working were the most friendly and kind people. They even said, we love having you guys here. We bring our kids here. We bring our kids to the show. We love the Dallas Card Show. Please stay out as long as you want. And this is trade night at 1 a.m. And I got a shout out to this lady, Lisa. She was like the manager on staff, the overnight manager. Kate, she was taking care of people. She was bringing them tea. She was... She was uh, managing like the cafe there, like bringing water. This is 1, 2, 3 a.m. Uh, so this staff, uh, it's an amazing venue. Amazing venue and amazing staff. Uh, and sh- just shout out to the organizers. So, Luke and Asia, what you just heard, I'm going to um, I'm gonna kind of give a story of my own life. My mother once traveled to the Galapagos Islands. And it was a, it was a, very, good, it was a very good trip, allegedly. And I mean, you'd like to think that's one of those bucket list trips, right? I mean, Darwin, right? It was, it's, it's sort of like, you know, where, where, you know, he, he, he looked at all the different species of animals and it's supposed to be beautiful and lush and the whole deal. So I said to my mother, I said, so how was the Galapagos Islands? She said, well, I didn't fly straight there. I flew to uh, West Palm Beach first and I stayed with um, Stephen Zimmerman, who you know. Um, and I stayed there for a day. You know, he moved into a nice condo in West Palm. And, you know, I stayed there overnight uh, before I flew to the Galapagos. And we had, we ordered from a pizza place uh, down the block from his new condo. And um, the pizza place was good. But, you know, it's not New York pizza, but the garlic knots were very, very, very good. Um, And I stayed over and then I flew to Galapagos Islands. I came back and I I flew into Fort Lauderdale and I stayed with Paul Zimmerman and his wife, but they're divorced now. And the pizza place that we had was just, the garlic knots were terrible. And I said, this was what I learned about the Galapagos Islands. I mean, if I went there, I would know all of the species of finches. I would know all of the crazy stuff about the Galapagos Islands. So, folks, what you just got from Andrew was um, what my mother did to me with the Galapagos Islands. How was the Dallas show? The staff at the Marriott You're and the terrible neighboring metaphors. restaurants. That doesn't uh, make sense. The staff at the Marriott was fantastic. This lady Lisa was bringing people tea. At the trade night, which is sort of tangential, right? So there was an entire day of show. I don't know how many dealers there were. I don't know what the deal flow was. I don't know whether the dealers were dealing with themselves. I don't know if the dealers had a lot of foot traffic. I don't know how big the show was. I don't know whether or not there were deals to be had for people like Andrew. Um, I don't know anything about the show. What I know is that Lady Lisa brought tea to people at the Marriott during the trade night at 1 a.m., so I'll ask again, how was the actual show in Dallas? The metaphor was solid if your mom in that it's Brooklyn solid, Jewish accent it's a solid at the Galapagos, the pizza was good. So hospitality matters. No. How you're welcome matters. <laughs> how was the show itself, pal? Five minutes so, in, so you there's... spent time at a show. How, did you actually go to the show or did you just go to the Marriott and have tea? With Lisa. 
It's very possible, <laughs> and, and everyone's okay if that's the case. Uh, the show's amazing. The show's right, really good. good. Here we go. But, but here's here's what was was so cool about this. I've I've made a I've made it a point to go to more shows because, well, I just want to learn, and it's nice to have Chantilly and then this show back to back. I realized that there are two different types of shows, and really, I think that comes from who are the dealers at the shows. If we just take Chantilly, Chantilly is a legacy autograph show, so half the show is autographs, mm -hmm. and then it's it, it felt localized they felt that a lot of the dealers were true collectors that were given both space to uh to set up so what you know there was people kind of selling pictures with autographs in chantilly um it, it was a collector show where i brought people steph curry cards and stuff like that and they're like oh i'm getting this card for my dad he loves steph curry or hey i collect panini one in one first release 2019 i want that card or it was a collector show where the end consumer that was buying the the, end, the buyer was the end consumer Mm -hmm. At this show, the dealers were going to the Bay Area next week. They were at Nashville the week before. They're going to be at the Philly show. They're dealers. They're traveling the country setting up. So what they're doing is they're buying, but they're cutting our heads off, just simply put. They're buying at 60%. And they're buying at 60% of comps, but what are true comps? In a market like this where there's a lot of volatility between the last comp and the first comp, what is the true comp? So they're buying 60% off of the lowest comp that they find and hoping to sell at the next show for 100, 115%. And they're making this 40% of it because they got to pay for hotel and travel and all that stuff, which is fine. But what I believe is going to happen with the hobby, with all of these uh, dealers with cameras on top of them, is they're sort of cutting the legs out from the buyers, right? Eventually, uh, this gig is going to be up and they're actually not going to have anybody to sell to. Right, they're just going to have all this inventory that they bought at a good deal, but knowing consumer. And that well, what are they buying? What are they buying at sixty percent? Because I mean, this is a great, great start. The last sure. two minutes, I love it because obviously I'm going to go into a bunch of questions, which are: Is the Dallas show less sustainable than the Chantilly show? But my first question becomes this: Are the dealers buying a different type of item than the collectors? Something that can easily be churned throughout a season, per se? Because what I'm yeah. saying to you is, you know, if you had the Dallas show and dealers are there paying 60%, wouldn't the collectors just offer 70? Or do the collectors not get a chance? Are there bulk deals going on? Are there no collectors there? There it is. So there you go. So talk to me about that. Uh, well, I mean, there's not no collectors, right? But they're they're few and far between. They're outnumbered. Okay. Um, I think they're buying liquid stuff. I think they're buying stuff that they know they could move easily. Um, they're buying Prism Soccer. Okay. They're buying the soccer of, of the guys mm -hmm. for the World Cup. Uh, that could have a performance. They're buying quarterbacks and they're buying Giannis and Luca. Uh, Giannis, Luca, uh, not a ton of Curry or LeBron, believe it or not. Uh, or they're buying prospects of players where the next show will be. So Poole did really well at this show. And a lot of people were asking about Poole, not because they're believers in Poole, but because they're going to the Bay Area show next week. Right. Okay. It's funny. Uh, it is funny. Uh, so I, I don't think one is good or bad. Um, I just but what you can learn from that, right? Show calendars. Yeah. Right? I mean, what's the show after the Bay Area calendar? If you happen to be going really? to the Bay Area show, you know, then maybe maybe sell your maxi stuff at the Bay Area show. You know what I mean? Or buy maxi at the Bay Area show and then fly and to sell Philly it to Philly. Sell, exactly. Sell maxi and Hertz. Uh, so you have that little bit of arbitrage because uh, what they're doing is going to show where there's going to be demand for that player. Right. They're hoping that, you know, someone brings a son, daughter, um, family who are true collectors or who are just getting into the hobby. And they're like, oh, I want a pool because I live in the Bay Area. I want a maxi because I live in Philly and Harden's out. So uh, or, you know, I want a beat or et cetera. So, so I mean, it's the business model for these guys. Let's just go through it. Right. Is to find three cards at 60 percent of comps that they think they can move in the next show. Because now you have let's just add 360 together is 180. And if they're able to sell two of those threes cards at 100% of comps at the next location to kids or families or people who are collecting. They've turned that 180 into 200 just on two cards. Correct. Where they can make some profit on the three, the whole deal. And you're basically, you know, you're basically saying this is something that you don't think can be sustained. Eventually the well runs dry because think about the, the person that sold those cards, right? Like, Eventually, they're going to run out of liquidity to go back and buy more cards. They're not going to be able to buy off of eBay or wherever they buy. And the comp is just going to go lower and lower and lower 
And now how is that dealer going to be able to convince somebody to pay what the, what they bought it for? You mean the end consumer, right? But if their market is to buy one week and flip it in the next week, two or month, there's not a lot of time for comps to creep in and really undercut them. You know, if they're really just flipping, that's like the legitimate, you know, you epitome of God. in a good market or a flat market. Yeah, I'm saying right now, yeah. it's just like a crazy market, dude. Because Holland, who's had an amazing season, his color blast, first year color blast, has ended as high as 3,300, and this weekend ended at 1,200. Wow. Because not because. Not because no one wants that card. They're just looking at other things. They're watching football games, they're watching basketball, they're traveling, they're watching the World Series, they're at shows. They can't keep up with all of this. And they if a year ago they were buying 25 cards a weekend, they're buying four. Yep. And how many Holons became available in the last couple of weeks, too? It, exactly. So it's, it's this collision of factors where we, we think we live in comps. Every dealer there was comp driven. It, it, it's, it's, it, it hurts me to my core. Because all they do is like, they'll just pull out their phone and be like, okay, this last one sold for 700. I could offer you four. And you said, no. I said, let's make deals. Let's have fun. Like, what, what do you have? Let's trade. I'll add cash. Did that work? Did that? I had a great show. I loved the show. I had a good time. I left with cash. I left with a pop five, uh, PSA 10 Jordan Jersey card. It's not, uh, I, I love the patch cards. I think they're cool, man. I think the patch cards are super, super cool. You know that. Yeah, we've been um, talking about them. The game, the game one stuff, especially, just because we're not like getting it anymore. Yeah, I like it. I think it's fun. I think they're cool. Um, I could always buy back into a Giannis auto. I could always buy into like a fourth year Curry auto. But there's, uh, and, and it was just cool to observe, man. It was really, really cool to observe and uh, and just be a part of uh, the whole thing. Like, I'll give you an example. So, uh, yeah. A girl was trying to buy a red prism. Cristiano Ronaldo card, BGS 95, 2014 Prism. A nice card, like 2,500, 3,500 bucks. She was like really wanted to buy it, really excited about it. You know, last comp was 3,700 and one on Saturday night ended on Golden for 2,500 as she was at the table trying to buy it off of a buddy, right? So is it at a $2,500 card? Is it a $4,000 card? Portugal is well set up to do well, at, to do a good things at this World Cup. Young team with a veteran like Cristiano Ronaldo. He's excited to be away from Man U and with the, this is probably his last World Cup. Four thousand dollar card, but golden. Everyone's at the Dallas show. All the people, a lot of people that would probably be bidding on that on that Cristiano card are at the show. So it ended light, and she was she was like, "Oh, oh my god, this just came up. I can't buy this card now for three thousand. This one just ended at twenty five hundred. You're not a collector. There's ten of these graded. You're just hoping to buy it for one price and sell it for the next price two weeks later. Well, is it fair to say she's not a collector just because she doesn't want to pay? If the dealers are comp, 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 why can't a collector be like, well, I can't pay three thousand for this one. Somebody just paid twenty five hundred. Yeah, but the but the it's pop ten. The last auction was like three months ago, and it ended at thirty seven hundred. And this guy was giving three thousand for that card. All right. If that one comp didn't end uh, that night, when all of the buyers or many of the buyers were at Dallas, she would have been happy. If that comp would have ended at four thousand, she would have bought the card. Right, but it didn't. But, but it did it not because it's, the card has changed. It did it because maybe there wasn't a second, second bidder because that second bidder was traveling and doing shows. Right, but it's a pop 10. So <laughs> couldn't you also say at the same time that maybe there were only two bidders for the card when it sold for 3700 A thousand million percent. You know? Well, if I were, I'd be like, all right, we'll close it on the three. But even if I would have bought this card, the cheapest I would have got it for was 2600 because I would have had to beat that person's 2500 right? You got to bid higher anyway. So it's not really twenty five if I'm in there. And then maybe that person would have bid more. So yeah, I get I get what you're saying. I'm I'm I don't want to say I'm playing devil's advocate because I hate when people do that. But obviously, there's two sides to the comp equation, especially on low pop things like that, right? You know, one was thirty seven hundred, one's twenty five hundred. The Holland's a great example, right? Three grand to thirteen hundred, right? All it takes is a bidder here and there, and it basically it it shows the lack of liquidity in this market and how different cards are from things like liquid stocks. I put a, a chart up about like Bitcoin and, and I put, you know, gold and S&P 500. I said, hey, you know, get, don't get crazy. You know, you're not liquidating your 401k. Some of the messages that I got were, you know, hey, cards are not like stocks. And yeah, they're not. I mean, they're not. I mean, people should know that. And, that, you know, that wasn't what I was trying to say. Although you can make an argument that, you know, 
they're like an alternate asset class in the whole deal. We talk about it like that, but I mean, you've said it all the time, right? I mean, when when you buy stock, you're buying a piece of a company. You know, the assets of that company, what's behind the company, a dividend if they pay a dividend. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a of a different story. But what one thing that stocks usually bring to the equation, depending upon the type of stock, is liquidity. You know, which which drives confidence in pricing. You know, if a share of you know Amazon is a thousand dollars today. Chances are it'll be a thousand dollars or close to it tomorrow, next week, you name it. Now there's earnings events and there are things that happen just like in sports, where there's you know sporting events and championships and the whole deal that could cause some fluctuation in the pricing. But the liquidity is there. You should know this is what it trades at. You know, there are buys, there are sells, there are all that stuff. Cards a little tough with pop ten. Well, there's similarities, but they're not identical. And we could debate how much similarities there are, but they're not identical. Um by any means, for one, stocks are uh, what are they, non fungible. Every stock is the same as every other stock. Every Luca Prism is not the same as the other Luca Prism. True. And, and it made me understand this weekend, it clicked why the Luca Blue is worth 4X. Because it, what people want is the card that everybody else wants mm-hmm. of an uh, amazing player. Correct. So you have to check the earnings box. But you also have to check the box of that's the card that everyone's going to want. That's going to be the card. And that clicked for, clicked for me. Another difference between Chantilly and uh, Dallas was on our vlog, we did our first vlog with Cage. The first kind of scene, maybe a minute in, is Cage looking through this awesome vintage table collection, right? Mm-hmm. No, not at this show. This this was modern. This was a modern show of, of liquid stuff. You know, there wasn't. It was just, it was the stuff you'd see like on, on weekly. I, I don't want to like cut. It, it was a modern show. That was my interpretation. Modern show cards you see very often changing hands all the time. But it wasn't like those the the vintage table that you stumbled upon and you were starting like kind of talk with the with the dealer like oh this is so cool or and this is that was the thing with national too right like you stumbled upon that like nineteen fifteen bat. Yeah. Obviously, national is its own thing, but that was a big difference too. Like at these collector shows, you see items that you might never see for another year. Versus here, mostly 99% of the table, Herbert Burrow, Mahomes, uh, Jalen Hurts, Tua, Curry, Giannis, Jordan, the modern stuff, the stuff you see. Yeah. So what do you prefer? Why? What is something that's good about each one, something that's bad about each one? What do you leave with? Like, which one of these shows, you know... I mean, obviously, you can talk about how much fun you have at them and, you know, the, you know, the different learnings you have from them. But talk to me a little bit about each show. Because what I'm getting is the Dallas show is more for the business that's been going on in the hobby the last couple of years. All right. Um, does that scare you in any way? Or does that make you optimistic? Is it something that is, you know, something that we're glad it's there? Because if the hobby picks back up steam, the market gets better. You need those shows for liquidity for all these businesses. Talk to me a little. And uh, I'll give an analogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, in soccer, there's firm ground, cleats, turfs, and soft ground. Do I prefer to play on a beautiful pitch, grass, you know, just rained a little bit before? And yes. But if it's a turf field, I need to wear turf cleats. If it's a nice field, I need to wear my firm ground cleats. And if it's a very soft field, it was pouring two days ago and it's a really soft pitch and I need those metal studs. Those are the cleats I need to wear. I just need to know the field. You got to come in prepared with. If you're buying, if you're if you're buying, you need to come in prepared. If you're selling, you need to come in prepared. You need to have the inventory that these people would want. So you went this time around, and you switched your inventory up a little bit. You made some deals on cards that you didn't want to have, and yeah. you moved into some cash and some cards you do want to have. The show is again when you know, a month, two months. I think it's every two months. Okay. Would you go back in two months? Yeah. Even though you've now, so so you're going to have inventory that you're going to do the same thing. Well, I'm in an interesting stage, Cage. Like, um, I'm not trying to lose money, but I'm, yeah. my number one goal is not to make money. My, my number one goal is to pay down experience tax, right? It's to go from what I think I know to what I've experienced and to what I've actually, like, you have knowledge and you have experience. And sometimes we confuse those two. Mm-hmm. I want to transfer knowledge to experience for as little by losing as little money as possible. That's the stage I am for probably the next 12 to 24 months. Makes sense. Makes sense. But I mean, with the experience of the Dallas show here, you're, you've moved into other cards. Did you move into cards that are liquid? 
move into cards you're going to move again or you're going to you're going to have by the next time this is there two months from now you'll have other cards that you buy that you're going to be looking to get out of you're looking to sell i mean like so so it's great to watch the show and obviously the oh, ones on there, you see one. the difference you understand what i'm asking yeah right? like you want a real tangible one sure collectors love sgc flippers love psa in okay. investors let me let me take scratch that flippers because i don't like that word collectors love sgc investors love psa there was not many sgc cards at the show not many okay and they were not moving so you but were having at, a in chantilly time. yep good people love that SGC. they love the tux they love how it looks they love getting the exact same card fairly graded for 60 percent now I know. Now I've learned that experience. Now I know which cards should be in PSA slabs versus which cards should be in SGC slabs. But you've learned that at Dallas. You don't need to learn that again in two months. No, exactly. where, I'm, where I'm trying to exactly. go is you exactly. Know, That's what well it's, it's a good learning experience. Now you'll know what to bring. You're not going to be hawking SGC nines at the Dallas show. I guess where I'm going is That's a great off, point. That's an amazing point. I mean, my my thing is you start off by saying, you know, they're cutting their own heads off, right? Mm -hmm. So sustainability of this, right? Sustainability of trying to buy from each other for 60 and then sell for 120. Or deal, so, so I guess really where I go is there are different types of shows. Some could be considered like wholesale shows. Some could be like more retail shows. And I remember, by the way, I remember this with Beanie Babies. No bullshit. There were Beanie Baby shows in the 90s. And some shows, that Parsippany show in New Jersey that switched from cards to Beanie Babies, you'd walk in and they had – it wasn't just, hey, buy a Beanie Baby. It was buy the the, the, the the dozens in the sealed bags from Hallmark or from the stores that these guys were going, just like blasters, just like cases, you name it, the whole deal, getting them. And people were coming and buying them at bulk discounts and then going to a more local show in Brooklyn or wherever, the Golden Gate. Uh, hotel off the Bell Parkway and selling the individual ones for a significant markup. Is that part of what it is? Is Dallas more of a dealer to dealer type of so. show? And these people get their inventory there. Everybody's churning their inventory and then they can go back and have story sales or take it out to California or bring it back to a show in Boston or Florida or wherever it is they're going next and, you know, try to move it that way. Are the dealers or the, the participants at a Dallas show more of like middlemen? I, I think so. And let's remember, this is just Andrew's uh, Yeah, but that's all we have. Interpretation. Uh, but I, I would certainly say so. I would also say the demo was much younger. Like uh, the demo at Chantilly, I would say, if, if we kind of average it out, was maybe 35 to 60, mm -hmm. even of the dealers. I would say the demo here was 18 to 35. Right. Predominantly. So, so a completely different demo. Well, the show is a newer show, right? Yep. And you would think that it also has newer participants in it. I mean, a any conversations with any people who are, you know, expressing frustration over the current market? I mean, obviously, people want their cards to go up in value. I'm just curious uh, with conversations about it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm taking my ball and I'm going uh, home like a Zion a big, Optic rookie. So this one, <laughs> the Zion Optic rookie, uh, a big one is these companies want auction houses to start working together about when they list cards. Now, I don't believe – I think – I get really st really worried about idealistic views. Like they sound good in principle, but they're unimplementable, right? So it's very mm -hmm. scary for me. You always want to live with two feet on the ground while you're dreaming but still have two feet on the ground. Um, but that was a recurring theme of these auction houses need to be – in, working in conjunction of when their auctions are ending, what cards are in those auctions, and what cards are in other auctions ending simultaneously to theirs. Why? Why what? Why should they control what comes to the market? Well, was anybody asking them to do that while prices were going up? Why should they? Do... We try to compare prices going up and down. Uh, in the same fashion, but when prices are going up, I, I struggle to verbalize it, but it makes sense in my head. It's a big party. Could, it's a big party. Everybody's no, having fun. I understand. But when Listen. prices are going down, only a select few are partying and everyone else is getting 
So the people who are saying the auction houses need to work together are the people who are basically, I'll translate it, saying that they need to artificially prop up prices because they are looking for something other than a free market. A free market would say if somebody wants to sell their card and they want to sell it now, they should be able to go to an auction house. An auction house should be able to sell it. The auction house is working together to um, limit the amount of LeBron chromes that get sold or Mahomes, I, whatever it is. It's I actually think it would be collusion. In in some markets, that would be called collusion. Like I think you can't even do that. Uh, but I don't know. I really don't know. But that was a, a recurring theme. In a world where we're trying to have as much transparency about supply, demand, and you know real valuations, you wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to have people could sell the sales of the sales. This is a market though where it's very difficult to have transparency, right? Because you, you know it's it's very hard with private sales to know whether or not somebody actually paid very hard to know whether our deals were were you know were consummated even on auctions i personally got a bunch of you know unpaid bidder notifications today um you know i'm sure that's happening a lot more with you know various consigners um and you know the the comps that before you didn't have to worry about that because everybody was just paying and paying record prices every next sale was a record 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 you didn't have to worry about the you know the cleanliness of the data because everybody was paying for these things now on their way down people aren't aren't paying I, I understand, you know, what people are saying about, you know, auction houses working together and these guys working together, um, you know, and I sort of agree with it, you know, to a certain extent, um, you know, the, I don't know how we get there though, but you know, when Heritage had their mantle nine five SGC, like it, you know, if I were someone in the hobby that wasn't directly related to Heritage, but I was also a hobby business. I'd be going out there and promoting the card, right? Instead of drawing battle lines, right? You know, maybe PSA didn't want to promote it because it wasn't in a PSA slab. Maybe Golden didn't want to promote it because they are a collector's company and also it wasn't being sold through them. Maybe PWCC didn't want to promote it because it wasn't being sold through them. I don't know. For all I know, they may have actually done some promos, but if I were one of them, I would have probably tried to you know do some posts about how great it is that this record price is you know being out there for a card why because the next time a monster card comes up right then you're gonna be the beneficiary of heritage talking about what a great card the luca logo man is that's being sold in the premiere and you know next time golden sells a honus wagner PWCC and, you know, and Heritage are going to talk about, wow, this Honus Wagner, you know, every time one of these sells, it sells for more money, blah, blah, And then, you know, people looking in are seeing what I would call a unified front and we're able to kind of, you know, attract a bigger audience. We, we talk about this, right? Like everybody wants the hobby pie to grow instead of just the companies who are here fighting over the same old slice. It's very easy to say, right? I mean, it's very easy for me to just say that. I mean, these are competing companies that deal with quote unquote record prices and that is their advertisement. You know, come to us and here's our record price. Like I still get the I got Heritage book in the mail yesterday. Big thick color book, you know, of, of stuff. And and you know, if you open up the, the mailer, it just says right there, record prices. You know, I mean that's a I mean it's a gorgeous card, right? And, and if you flip to like the back of it, they are it's an advertisement. It basically Jeez. like, hey, consign with us. Look at the record prices we've gotten on these things, right? So it's tough for a business like that to also push another hobby participant, you know, in their lane to also get record prices. But I think that's the next evolution of this stuff. I think that's kind of the way it's got to be. Guys, uh, fun, like, so I think if, you, how, how do you get one of these? I don't want to misspeak. You, you I, bid, you registered and you bid and you, 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 um, you, you click in there once you register that, that, that you want a paper. Okay. Um, do you have book. to pay for this? No. I highly, highly Love recommend you guys sign up for these for Heritage and uh, request one of these. Um, they're super cool. They're really well done. Yeah, and you could learn a ton, and you could see a lot of inventory. So much of what's in here comes from those books. Not stuff that I bought, but stuff that I thought about buying. Stuff I didn't know existed. I mean, it's like it's like an encyclopedia every every two months. It really is. It, it's it's really cool stuff, guys. So so it's this one was called like Platinum Night Heritage from August. You see the. SGC 95 mantle right here. That was the national. Yes, yeah, national. That's cool stuff. Like just like putters, you know, 
rings. And then you have a little bit of like an anecdote story right here on the other side. And it, it, it's fun. It's amazing for your coffee table. It's amazing when guests come over to have this and kind of be like, hey, you know, like tell me more about cards. You have this handy. Highly, highly recommend. That's so, one of them. That's real quick, guys. Yeah. Maybe if people are interested, they could uh, DM you if they cover shipping. Maybe I'll send a few out to people signed by uh, Cage Lawyer. And if we're lucky, Cage's mom, she, but she might be at the Galapagos right now. No, um, she's in Gallagher, not somewhere. Uh, remember, so this is all my opinion, my two cents. Mine too. You guys can go back and listen to the 10 takes uh, from the first 10 days of the NBA season. I say things with so much confidence because I've been watching NBA since basically 2000. I love the sport. I've, I, I'm confident when I say I've watched it. Here's what's going to happen. My take with Patrick Mahomes being the best quarterback in the NFL, it's confident because I watch. This stuff is anecdotal. This is just opinion. It's experience. Share. Experience. Share. Take that with a grain of salt. Don't think that this is, you know, written in stone. It's fact. Just understand that, please. Of course. But nobody's expecting. I mean, we want to hear uh, it, <laughs> People haven't been to Dallas. I've never been to Dallas. This is actually a very interesting hobby. Yeah, but but beyond that, right? I mean, that's it's a couple of loud people, which is fine. I mean, you know, there are everybody in the hobby is loud. There was a guy playing who was doing roulette with cards. As as uh, have you seen that? No. Okay, forget it. Scratch. It. We follow different stuff, but I'll look for it. You can send me a link to it. No, but but people so want to hear about the show. People want to hear about the show. People want to hear about. The, I've never been to Dallas. You know, I mean, would you recommend people go? Or would you recommend a certain type of people go to it? Only flippers go. Oh, if you want to be successful, you have to go. You have to go to every show. You have to go to as many shows as possible. What's successful? Uh, un understand what you're doing. Experienced. Understand what who's doing. So, like, you if you want to be successful at what, you have to go. At flipping? At buying at, and no, selling no. cards? At making money? At understanding the hobby. At understanding the sports card industry, how it works, the plumbing, the behind the scenes. You have to be at shows to get a different perspective than online. It's true. You get to learn how shows are handled. You get to, yeah, what, what I urge you to do is you've been to so many shows, so you don't understand the value of them. Mm, For people who have gotten I, into the hobby in the last two years, they might not have your experience. And I would yeah, urge but, them to go to but, shows to get that experience. But going not, to shows, it's not cheap going to shows. I mean, you're telling people like the most, most people who are listening to this have, you know, they have budgets to buy their PC, right? They and their collectors. You're telling them they should be going, you know, to Burbank and going to Dallas. They should be spending more money on travel to go to shows than they're actually spending on their cards. I mean, yes, because that's called investing in your self cage. Uh, that's why we go to college. That's why we buy seminars because. I mean, you, if you want to learn, you have to go. You have to experience. It's not it's, that. It's not that confusing. But I mean, it depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, some of these people are not looking to make a business out of their okay. cards, right? It's like buying a car were. just because I'm I own a car, right? It's and let's like call it a car. nice car. Like I have, I, I like cars, right? I, it doesn't mean you know I have a, a, a thirty or forty shows? or fifty thousand dollar car. It doesn't mean I need to go to college to learn the inner workings of of every single you know piece of the car and spend fifty thousand dollars on. On, on learning auto mechanics and going to you know all kinds of trade schools and all kinds of stuff just so that I can own a car that's worth 30 grand. Or you have to understand what? the audience. So I like cars. I own a yes. $30,000 car, right? And, and yes. I have a car, right? This car, yes. I don't know, whatever. Old Corvette, right? Cars have utilities, brother. Okay. Just go with me, dude. I'm dancing. What, I'm you're, hanging. You're, you're, you're being defensive for... A, I, you're Pardon. missing the point, right? So, yes... Going to shows is a helpful learning experience, but there are people who watch our show who spend five thousand dollars a year on their PC. Okay, it's your uh, you're telling them right now that that five thousand dollar PC that maybe they hope grows over time and they fill in what you name it that they should as a a something to help their five thousand dollar PC. They should spend twenty thousand dollars in travel, going to Dallas and Burbank, and going to the Chantilly show. They should go just go to shows so that they can learn about the hobby for their five thousand dollar collection. That that doesn't sound like a waste of money for you. My turn. No. Yeah. They should spend forty five hundred dollars on their PC for a year and go to five local shows where they go for one day. Easy. And they could drive. Done. Perfect. 
Perfect. That's where we're going. I think that makes 100% sense. And yes, the shows are very different. And what I'll tell you, my experience with shows recently, you can see a big difference. And that's another thing. Going to shows, you know, you can see the up market, the down market. You can see how people are acting at the shows. You see how, how deal flow is. You see how, you know, engaged people are, both the dealers and the buyers. And, and there are shows I leave and I'm like, oh, shit, that's not good. But that's the, it's also very show specific. And I think what you're bringing up here is, is very important. You, you're going to leave the Hofstra show with a very different take than you leave a Burbank show or a Dallas show, even in the same market. Even in right. up markets, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, and we it, think it, of investing in cards, but we don't think about investing in ourselves. Number one, that I think that's the most important thing is investing in your knowledge and your experience. I think people understand that. It's just uh, what I'm trying to say is the, you know, don't get carried away. You're not saying business. you have to fly this to Burbank life, first you know? class and buy a hotel room and stay there for four nights and spend 5k. If you spend 5k on cards all year, I'm not saying that. Okay. But I'm saying if there's a, a show two hours away, you could make the Hell drive yeah. there for the day you drive home. And let us and know if you're going. This way I could bring you a cigar and make it worth and the, the trip. And the second thing is, I don't care who you are. Nobody likes losing money. Correct. It doesn't even matter if you're PCing. Like, nobody likes to see their PC cut in half in price. Like, no one likes losing. We're competitive people. We like to win. Human beings are very competitive. So you could PC all you want, but you also want to be right. You want to have success. Right. But if you have a budget for a hobby and you're already losing money because cards are going down, I don't know how much help you're doing but, yourself. But that's the issue, on the show. It's you a know? hobby. You're losing money. So you're like, oh, this sucks versus it's a hobby. I'm losing money because I lack some kind of knowledge or experience. Let me, instead of investing in the hobby, invest in my experience so that for the in two, three, four years, I can benefit. I'll know how to – I mean this hobby is confusing. So I'll know how to – understand it better i'm, I'm not going to go into each nuance of you know which card to buy of which player which cards sell better which slabs sell better all of that nuance that comes with being there and trying to make deals the art of negotiating the art of a deal the art of trading the art of selling the art of setting up your showcase of which cards are where there's so much of this nuance that this this information i don't think should be this experience shouldn't be lost on people. 90% of the hobby is never going to set up a showcase. They're never going to want the art of the deal. They're never going to want to know the difference between what sells what for what where. They just want to collect. And the collector's okay. being lost in a lot of no, fuck that. the hobby business for the last couple of years. I think that really The art is of the deal and setting up doesn't make you any less of a collector. Of course it does. Once you oh, set up, God. you're not a collector. Once you set up, you're a dealer. It's the very definition of making you less That's than a collector. That's so naive and short, so short-sighted. I mean, it's also right. No. You're saying things as they're definitive, as they're opinions. It's not an opinion. You are a dealer. Once you have a table, you're a dealer. That's what. That's the definition right. of it. And it's not an opinion. <laughs> I mean, it's right. not an opinion. It's true. You're most a people dealer. And because you're a dealer, be... you can't be a collector. No, no, you, you can't, can't be both. But most people who are collectors don't want to be dealers. And that's like two... <laughs> You, you and your terms. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, I, I understand what you're saying. I guess where I'm going with it is, you know, what makes this fun is that there are different types of people in it. And um, there are some people who don't give a shit about what happens in Dallas. And we're, ha we're happy for that. What does that mean? We love them. The people who are listening right now who are building up their collection, like somebody who may have a, a PC of Craig Kimbrell. Right, who sent he was me some an incredible pictures. closer for the Red Sox and, and, the, and the Braves, and he sent me he sent me a picture of this awesome card that he Red picked Sox. up, one of one. He was on the Red Sox, yes, he was. Was he was you on the Red Sox? Do you even watch the games, bro? He was on the Red Sox. Anyway, that guy doesn't care about what Jalen Hurts sells for at Dallas because of what he might be able to sell for in Philly a couple weeks later. That's an entirely different part of the business. Why does that person li listen to our show then? Because they like the banter back and forth. There it is. You get banter like back and sports. forth at shows too. That's they like you, the, we didn't they like talk the about banter. All the, all the relationships, all the fun. Well, I'm asking. You tell me, dude. I wasn't there. I told you about Lisa. You yelled at me. Fuck Lisa tea. wasn't. Lisa was an employee of a Marriott who was bringing tea to people at one a.m. That wasn't the banter of the show. Tell me some banter of the show. Tell me some back and uh, forth. Tell me one of the crazy conversations. One of the earliest guys I met in the hobby when I went to the White Plains show with Zion, 
with my silent cards to get graded. Uh, and then the February run up when I was at the Valley Ford show, he came up to me and he was trying to troll me with like, oh, Gary V Disciple. Oh, what is Gary pumping these days, bro? What are you buying? Talk to me. Uh, and I was like, are you trolling me? Are you drunk? Because we could have a combo, but if we're going this route, it's going to end a little different. Are you drunk? And, and he was. And then we actually had like a three, four hour conversation where he's he's a really smart kid. Really At Dallas? Kid. Yeah. And he was yeah. like, I love to see how you guys' podcast has evolved and how it's gone from, you know, you're just getting into the hobby and how you reason and you guys used to get plays. And now you guys are, you know, talking about X, Y, Z. And I love to see the evolution of the show. Um, so it was pretty cool. It was really cool. That's awesome. Mojo. Mojo is fantastic. Um, got to set up with uh, a guy named Nick who puts on the autograph show. That was fun. Um, got to be- What's the best thing you walked away with? What's your best card you walked away with? One, one, one more second. I, I want to urge people, especially the accounts that love to come after people, to be able to draw this line in the sand. A company isn't their employees, right? Oftentimes we come after people's companies, but when you, you have to realize that there's just employees that are trying to make a living and stay in the hobby too, mm -hmm. right? And they're doing the best they can at what they're doing. Uh, and oftentimes we like love to like Democrats, Republicans. I hate this and I love this. But remember that there's other people behind the scenes who love collecting and you should be able to separate the company from the employees. The best card I came, I came away with I like that. The, the, the Jordan Moulton PSA 10. I like that. Card. I like what's Jordan. one card you move that you're happy that you're no longer holding that you were nervous about. I guess sellers were more so all the time, but I was happy I sold Giannis. It was kind of a cageism. Sell when uh, strike when the iron's hot. Like everyone was buying Giannis. That's where their eight and their start. And you guys know I love Giannis. But dude, you could get back into a Giannis. There's so many Giannis cards. If you're not buying like his prism gold or green, even the greens, you could get back into a Giannis card. And he's eight and oh. They've had the easiest schedule in the NBA. Uh, we're about to go through like the winter, which is always interesting in the NBA when people kind of get bored of it. They mm -hmm. say it's uncompetitive unless you're like love the NBA. Most people don't watch other than the Christmas games from basically like December to after the all-star break. So I was happy I moved Giannis. Strike when the iron's hot. Smart. The lesson learned there. You're at a show. People are probably, you know, the customers are probably asking for Giannis cards as they walk in. You sell Everywhere. it to a dealer. Or to a to a um, you know like actual actual consumer, they sell it to a collector, you sell it to a dealer. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, Panini hooked it up, so like Panini had this White Sparkle National event where they basically botched who to give the White Sparkle cards to. <laughs> so Luke Cage and I had a call with them maybe like two months ago. And they were like, Are you going to use all 170 of these redemptions? And we're like, We haven't done it yet, so I think chances are we're not. <laughs> what we're going to do is probably give them out to people, and so they have a good time, and maybe. Just maybe you guys will have new people checking out Panini Direct. So we had these white sparkle cards, and we were able to get to give it to kids and stuff like that, so they could redeem. You it. don't like how I give it? I give them away on whatnot, and I read well, the code I, out to actually, people. <laughs> that's what I would do. I'd say, "Hey, Dallas, hold up, hold up, X Y forty two three three four five six and everyone would look at me like, "You should." Dude, somebody say, "Come get this guy." That's Someone, it. Do we get good attention? Do we get good? Do we, we, we get you good attention? That's good stuff. These I think are, part these ones. This one. Be careful. You guys watch it on well, you know, don't I, put the QR code up there. Somebody could steal the codes. Somebody could steal the white sparkle out of eight. So there's that. We haven't spoken since the Houston Astros won the uh, won the World Series. But you know, baseball's over. Everybody's tied for first again. So nobody cares. I give him credit. I give him credit on the story. Obviously, uh, you know, I mean, they won. That's two championships in six years. You know, it really you know provides some legitimacy to the team and you know to those guys. Um, Don't we watch sports because we love competition? Like at the yes. end of the day, like who wins and loses is cool for like four minutes, but we just want to see competition. I think why people hate the Astros is they cheated. Like it's pretty conclusive at this point. Like I, I don't know how you could defend it. And second is I hate when people who aren't from the area keep saying we. Stop saying we. You're not a part of the team. You've done nothing. You've eaten food and watched them play. Sometimes too much of it. <laughs> so there's Houston, um, the Jets. I mean, the Jets at Caesars win total this year. By the way, that's not a shot at the two people that I really like. That's a shot for someone at New York because I do like the other ones. <laughs> five and a half. Five and a half was the win total for the Jets coming into the season, and they already have six. That's pretty crazy. I like some Rob Salah. Is that his name? Yeah. Or is it Mohamed Salah? No, Mohamed Salah is on Liverpool. Rob. Yeah, Mo Salah. Mo, Mo Salah. Uh, no, I like him as a coach. He was a 49ers defensive coordinator for a minute. Do you know who the coach of the Colts is as we record this? 
Uh, Philip Rivers. Jeff Andrew Saturday. Luck. Jeff Saturday. Oh, the big big guy from the Patriots. Never, never. No, no. The, he was the offensive lineman with Manning. He was the Colts offensive lineman. Colts offensive lineman. My apologies. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. I think he was the center. Never so, coached at any level ever. Never coached high school, college. Was never any type of a coach. No offensive coordinator, no nothing. And he's been named the head coach. There's really funny memes. The whole like, strategy you know, cut. But yeah, let's see. Yeah, 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 there's a lot of those memes going out out there. Like Stephen A. Smith, like, really? Me? Me? Like that one? And it's like Jeff Saturday when it's announced that he's the coach of the Colts. Me? Like, really? Me? It was probably, you know how they sit in like that auditorium and like, so, like there's someone like, and they're like, today we're announcing... Jeff Saturday is the coach, and he's like, a, a, "It's like, wait, wait, me? Does not sure you mean okay, that?" Dude, I'm happy you went to Dallas, and I'm happy it gives you kind of like a new kind of, you know, a new thought process on it. Everyone does. I mean, think about where we've all started. Like, would you ever have even opened up that heritage book? No, you turn around and be like, "What a waste of paper this is." I thought when you held that up, you were like, "Heritage, stop wasting money sending this stuff out." I could yeah. see it all online, but instead, you you're now go. This is like a it's it, it is. Where I love where you're going, and I don't want to poo-poo it with the money, but I do – when prices are going down, I do want to I, – I try to worry about the folks that just don't have any kind of loot. And you're right. They can go to a local show. They can still drive for two hours and get the same education and, and the whole deal. But I think where you're going with this, and this is one of the things I, I, I love about doing a show with you, there are a few. There are few or far between. But this is one. When things are tough, right? When things are are are, See the guy froze. no. When you don't have when you don't have like you don't have money, you don't have like things aren't going well. When when the markets are all flying, we're all high fiving and talking about all these great things. And look at this one. Look at this opportunity. Look at this one. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with when markets shift a little bit. You take a pause from all the money you have out there. Take a pause from the buying the whole deal, and instead take some time and maybe devote the resources that maybe you would have bought a Jalen Hurts card with to self improvement. Right to that education. I think that's where you're going, and and there are not a lot of people who preach this stuff. You still do. You have since day one, and I think the point is one that people should probably, you know, myself included. And I mean, I don't know a freaking modern world. And probably going to Dallas would be a great learning experience for me. Watching people, you know, get in and out of cards. One of the things that shocked me the most at a trade night at Hofstra, which was a very different thing, was a kid buying a card from me. And not finalizing the deal and then kind of walking away for a minute and say, hold on, I just got to go make a phone call. And he was legit trying to sell the card he was buying from me at a table 20 feet away for more money than he was paying me for it. Like that's the kind of, that's very if he, different. If he wasn't under 18, do you think we should have like beat him? No, up good for him. You know what really? I mean? Like I, I don't care. Like, take, I don't, and seriously. And, and, and that was an eye opening thing for me. And I think that happens at a mass scale week to week. With a lot of folks who are dealers at Dallas and going to the Bay Area next week and, and that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's, I mean, I implore folks to take a look at some of the charts on some cards for the decade leading up to 2018, 2017. And it's almost a flat line. But from 2018 to 2022, all of a sudden you have volatility. And there's volatility now. It's just volatility in a way that you don't want it. <laughs> a lot of money printing. Um, the only thing that separates you, you, where you are from where you want to be, and if you if you are where you want to be, you're truly happy, right? Happiness is being is having being where you've always dreamed to be. But if you're not where you want to be, which I believe some people in whatever area of life, love, find a career, whatever, health, it's either you don't have the beliefs, traits, or skills. It's one of those things. You don't you don't believe you could do it. You don't have the trait, which is like I'm disciplined enough to do it consistently over a period of time, or you don't know how. It's one of those things, beliefs, traits, or skills. So you have to identify and go get it and go figure that out. Because once you do, you're going to get there. It's not rocket science, it's math. I identify as a genius, by the way. That's a belief. Good. I believe I I could do it. I am smart. I am brilliant. I can learn this stuff. I believe I I can fly. Now, trait. I, I now I need to develop the discipline to do this on it. Now I have to develop the trait of X Y Z skill. I need to learn how to read a chart properly. I need to learn how to negotiate properly. I need to know how to which cards to bring to a show. I need to learn how to set up properly. So, I believe I can touch the sky. I believe it's a belief. I so, think about it every night and day. Mahomes, goat, incredible. I like Mahomes, goat. No. That was a rookie quarterback who doesn't have any of the offense and should have beaten the Chiefs yesterday. Come on, plus 12 and a half. That was a nice call. I was 8-4 and four against the spread yesterday. Tune nice. in for the whatnot show.
props. Mix, Mixon was just went insane. Mixon was, uh, oh my God. I was so, that was one of the four <laughs> games I just did not have the right read on at all. Mixon. I was telling people, a, I'll tell people to bench Mixon in our whatnot show for a fantasy. I was a bench him. He's going to be, he's, he's going to be part of the throwing game, but not get the rushes. He just hasn't had the, oh my God. He just went off. Went but off. eight and four against the spread, man. And that's, 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 if I give us a loss on the Rams last night with the Brady, Brady taking three, because I had it at, at two and a half. Some places had it at three as a push. I'm giving myself a loss on that. Half point loss, it's still eight and four. Re- revenge. I would never bet against Brady in revenge. And he's pissed, man. He's got a lot to prove. But here, here's a belief. What, you know, they say like character isn't developed in tough times, it's revealed. Yeah. I love what I'm seeing from Herbert, man. I love what I'm seeing from Herbert. The guy, they're five and three, man. And I, I would say that they probably have had the toughest stretch in this season. He's lost so many of his skill players to injury. He's hurt his rib, which is really tough if you're throwing. Yep. And to be able to be so resilient and to just grind out victories. Like sometimes it doesn't look pretty, but these are the times where I think when everything breaks your way, the way it is for Jalen Hurts. These are the times that I think your character is really kind of formed or revealed, whatever word you want to use. And th- it's made me a believer in Herbert. And now I'd be looking to buy him. And I'll add something. I think Fields is a really interesting prospect to buy in the offseason because I don't think he's going to have an amazing career, but I do think he'll have one Lamar Jackson-like season. I mean, he had a Lamar Jackson-like game. He had a game no one's ever had. 150 rushing yards and three passing touchdowns. Never been done ever. And he set the record for the most rushing yards of the Super Bowl year by a quarterback. I mean, it's pretty crazy what he, he what hasn't he, what had he, an easy stretch either. Like, Chicago's a tough place to play in terms of just like the weather. I, I don't know if he was coached by Nagy, but that program under Nagy was was it Nagy or the other one? Um, I always confuse those two weird coaches. The Jets and the Bears both hired these really weirdos. Like back to back, uh, I'll tell you who it was. Give me a sec. I mean, Nagy might be it, but I don't think. Was it no, Nagy? I don't know who the Jets. Who, which weirdo for the Jets? Who was? Remember the, the guy weirdo? that he he had a press conference and it literally looked like he was drugged out. His eyes were like this. No, the whole press. I'll, I'll, I'll give you. Give me a second. <laughs> That's amazing. But I now have to look it up. Now they have Matt Eberfluss as the Eberfluss. coach. Eberfluss talked about him yesterday. I'll tell you yesterday. who the coach is. You guys out there are probably screaming at your uh, – I like the Chargers, I, by the way. The Chargers call the Herbert. The only problem is Herbert's prices are down, but they were so high to begin with. It's not like they've even come down to a zone where I'm comfortable buying him yet. But, hey, look, over four and a half catches for Gerald Everett yesterday. Matt Nagy. That came in. Yeah, Nagy was Matt. the Bears. But I'm wondering, wondering who you're talking about with the Jets. I got you. Give me 35 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I'm always – I'm wondering who the Jets, uh, Jets coach you were talking about is. Not the Giants, not Judge. Do you do you think that loss uh, to the Jets caused uh, Allen to lose the MVP? No, no one, no one wins or loses the MVP in one game in the middle of the season. Okay, it was, right? it was so, zero touchdowns, one intercept, two interceptions to the Jets. Yeah, I mean, listen, Sauce Gardner, great defense. That defense Adam Gates, the- crazy oh, yeah, eye, Adam Gates. Yeah, yeah, okay, I forgot about him. Um, Honestly, that that MVP race is very, very wide open. Um, and what's really funny is with the Bills' loss, do you know who it opened the door for? Don't who, say if I were Cousins. Betting, he sucks. No, 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 no. If I were a betting guy, not that I think this is a favorite, he's not. But if I were betting, do you know what the odds on Tua to win the MVP are right now? <coughs> Tua's like 20 to 1. Wow. And, and... Because there's just so many other guys who are ahead of him. Hurts is like the favorite now, like two to one. Mahomes is there, and and obviously Josh Allen is there, and a bunch of other guys. Tua leads the league in QBR, and yeah, they look crazy guys. And the QBR leader has been the MVP, some like four, five, six seasons in a row. Right now, he leads the league in QBR. So I mean, he obviously has the weapons. I'm pretty sure. What what, what is he six and one as a starter? I mean. You know the I mean, highlight guys. Uh, remember Austin? Uh, they he he said that from the get. Like I got to tip my hat to him. Like the highline guys said that. He's um, you know he's just somebody who has put he's putting up ridiculous numbers. I mean when you have Tyreek 
and Waddle, you're going to put up great numbers. But look, look what his numbers are. I'm telling you, his QBR, which, you know, you can check those. He's number one in the league right now, QBR, which is usually – that's who wins the MVP. So, so for you guys listening, I, I won't do a screen share, but Tua has a QBR, uh, QB rating, right? That's yep. QBR. Uh, 115.9, he's first. Second is Hertz, 107.8. Gino is third, 107.2. Mahomes is 103.6. Burroughs, 102.6. Garoppolo's 100.7. And Allen's 99.2. Just to give you the first seven. So Kirk I mean, Cousins is 89.5. Right for now, you guys Hertz, I literally think sharing. Kirk Cousin with no favorite shirt on this morning. Yelling. Hertz is the favorite this morning after the games yesterday to win the MVP. I mean, it's not a click up favorite, but Hertz moved into the favorite spot. Um, I, I think, think that's the numbers. I think it's overvaluing the team's yeah. record and not his. He doesn't really have, although he had two touchdowns again. Um, he's, you know, he's starting to throw the ball um, for a little more touchdowns. He's, I mean, he's, listen, the guy, he's having a great year, but I mean, they're. It's so funny, you know, when I when I did my judge thing and I talked about, hey, there are a lot of people who have had great years, you know, and, and everybody I named, I got a message. Are you kidding me? You compared him to this guy? Oh, it's the same stuff. Anyway, um, what else have we got? We talked about Houston basketball. I have a question for you, but maybe we'll save it for another episode. Maybe it'll be a teaser, okay? Yes. When Curry's going well, people want to buy his cards. But when Curry's not going well, his cards dip. When LeBron's going well, people want to buy his cards. But when LeBron's not going well, his cards really don't dip the way that Curry do. There's still demand for LeBron. Is LeBron in, in a completely different category from Curry even? Because at the end of last year, people were saying Curry's a top 10 player and putting him in the same conversation. Is that something you can cover in 30 seconds or you want to save that Easily. as a hook? Easily. Okay. This is where experience and doing the stuff that we talk about watching PWCC weekly, even if you're not buying, it's a supply thing. So LeBron really has just a few sought after cards, a few sought after cards, especially when it comes to autos. He doesn't have a ton and all Curry has so many autos, man. So many autos. You probably see 15, 20 every auction. Uh, so it's just a supply game. There you go. I also think Curry is, you know, is he's been, he has more of a runway. So people will, will say that, you know, with LeBron, maybe he gets one more title. Maybe. And even that's asking for a lot. So you know what you have with LeBron, so the floor is in. Whereas there's more upside built into Curry because people are talking about, like, he could win another three. Like, they, you know, look, look at that. That dynasty is set up to win another three. We've talked about it ourselves. So, you know, and when they start off slow, you're like, they're not going to win another three. He's never going to win again. Like, boom. You know, that, that potential that was there that's not there for LeBron kind of comes into play. But you're right. I, I mean, when all else fails, keep it simple. Go back to supply and demand on almost everything. Panini is a, Panini has Curry signing. How many Panini autos is there of LeBron? Nada. None. Peace, Luca Nation. So thank you all for listening to another episode of Lucas Tigers and Bronzo oh Mai. I wanted to tell you about a new service that we have starting as of today, and I'm really, really excited to bring it to you guys. So as a part of our partnership with SGC, we got 50 free submissions every single month and many of you have taken advantage of that and it's amazing that we could have the opportunity to 650 episodes 675 episodes in to go ahead and give back to our community as people were sending those cards in they asked can we send 5 10 20 more cards to you guys we'll pay for it but we wanted them graded with sgc you guys know sgc is turning cards around in 13 to 14 business days uh, have incredible customer service, and their secondary market values are going up day after day after day. And that's exciting for the hobby and exciting for the grading landscape. So we didn't want to just rush into it. We wanted to do it right. And what we did was I relocated here to Boca Raton, Florida. I opened up a P.O. box maybe five minutes away from SGC, and I will be hand delivering and hand picking up the cards so you don't have to worry about anyone else touching your cards. It will be me. And I will update you every step of the way. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to personally pick up the cards from a P.O. box, prep them, new card saver, new penny sleeve, and deliver them to SGC every single Tuesday. Why Tuesday? Well, it lets the stragglers over the weekend come back through on Monday and gives me a day to prep. And it basically gives SGC the entire week to work on grading those cards. Once your cards pop, only then at the end of the process will you be paying for the service. It's $25 per card simple as that and the turnaround times have never been faster 
we're hearing right now 13, 14, less than 20 business days. So there it is. 9170 Glades Road. Number 135 is the P.O. Box in Boca Raton, Florida, 33434. 9170 Glades Road. Number 135, Boca Raton, Florida, 33434. Of course, you could shoot me an email or shoot me a text anytime, and I'm always available. Many of you already have my email. It's Goldberg at gmail.com or my cell phone number, 215-519-9154. Reach out with any questions. I could walk you through the process. I've hopped on the call with quite a few of you, and I'm happy to do that. Love you, Luca Nation.